Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this weekly program. And this is Open Line First Friday when it's your program to ask whatever question you might have about the journey to Jesus Christ in faith through grace and also the journey to his church. Any of the questions that you may have been saving up from week to week that you've wanted to pose to the guest, well, we have a returning guest this evening who is primed, ready, and willing to take whatever question you might pose. David Curry is my guest tonight. He's the author of a, of a very, uh, uh, I'd say, successful book in the sense of its impact on people. It's had great impact, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. His book was Born Fundamentalist, Born Again Catholic by Ignatius Press. Describes his journey and some of the reasons for his journey. David, you were maybe the eighth or ninth guest on the journey home about almost two years ago. And I've invited him back to uh, answer more of your questions. He did a fine job last time. Now remember, this is your opportunity to pose your questions. So if you would, call us at 1-800-221-9460, or you can email us at journeyhome at EWTN.com. David, welcome back to The Journey Home. Marcus, it's real good to be back. Since the last time I was here, we've had a, another little baby at home, and she's three months old. She's our third daughter and our eighth child. We've got oh, five sons. That's great. It's one of the best things about the journey home. It gets me back in touch with old friends. Yeah, it's good to see you again. <laughs> it's been a couple years. It's a fact I think it's been since you were here. I think that was the last time we, we saw each other quite a bit before the last time, and, right. and we've been, been both so, so busy since then. Well, what I'd like to do, uh, this first part of the program, as we discussed, is a way of priming the pump for callers. Start calling your questions in. But I'll ask a few things, and it's probably good since it's been about a year and a half or so since you were here, that you, uh, why do you summarize your journey into the Catholic Church to remind the audience? Well, uh, Marcus, just a, a quick thumbnail sketch. I was raised in a preacher's family in a fundamentalist church, uh, went to Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and while there started the seeds of my journey. Mm -hmm. And it basically uh, came from two different problems in in Protestantism. First of all, the question of scriptural authority. Where does it come from? How is it defined? Um, and, and on what basis do we take it? And then the second one was what scripture teaches about the Eucharist, as opposed to what I was being taught in churches and teaching in churches about communion or, you know, what Protestants call it, the Lord's Supper. Uh, and it took a long, long time. I'm a slow learner. I was actually 40 before I you know, came into the church and had struggled with some of these issues for 20 years. For 20 years, the journey was... Yeah, I didn't realize I was struggling with those issues for that long. Uh, the, the actual accelerated journey was just a couple years right there at the end when all of a sudden I realized, uh, as Cardinal uh, Newman said, there's only two paths, the path to Rome and the path to atheism. And it was uh, uh, during that last two years when I realized that that was the choice that I had. The trajectory of the path. Right. I did not have the choice to remain evangelical That's or right. fundamentalist but Protestant. Your, and your wife, your whole family came in with you? Right? Yeah, it was really exciting. Uh, it's really a story of grace, Marcus, uh, and I, I don't take any credit for it. Yeah. Uh, my wife came into the church the same day that I did, and at that time we had six children. We've got two cradle Catholics now. <laughs> I have eight children now. Uh, but our oldest six all came in uh, with us on the same day. All six of them were baptized on the same day uh, because being an evangelical, we would never have baptized any of our children at birth. We would have waited until they were 14 or 15. Well, many of you know, many of the audience may know of you because of your book, Born Fundamentalist, Born Again Catholic. And uh, I had the great privilege uh, two weeks ago of having a couple visit with us at our home. And I didn't know this until they sat down to share their own journey. They were, well, she was a cradle Catholic he was a, a cradle uh, fundamentalist, uh, as yourself. Uh, in, when they got married, she left the Catholic Church. They were missionaries for a number of years in Africa. They were back in the United States serving as missionaries in the inner city of a very large church. And I can't remember how, but someone gave them a copy of your book. And after reading your book, they both were totally convinced that they had to take the Catholic Church seriously, which they had never done before. And then after a year or so of study, they came into the church last December, and now we're studying uh, at a Catholic uh, college. And uh, it, was, it was great to hear the power of your witness through your book. And I, I thought I'd ask 
what you have heard of the impact of your book? Um, it's been exciting because uh, I, I didn't, as you know, didn't really set out to write a book for public Tell them again. Uh, consumption. I actually wrote the book for my family, three of whom are full-time ministers in the Protestant uh, denominations. So I actually wrote the book for them, and, and it was a long, lengthy letter. And uh, after it got done, a priest friend of mine convinced me to, to try to get it published. So Ignatius Press graciously decided to do that, and, and it's been gratifying. I wrote it primarily for evangelicals so that they could understand the Catholic mm -hmm. faith and understand why I did what I did. And it's actually a lot of reverts uh, have written me saying, you know, I was raised in the Catholic Church. I left and went to the little corner church down, uh, down the street, and it just wasn't meeting my needs. It just wasn't. I, you know, I missed the church, and yet I, I was convinced it wasn't true, that the Catholic Church was not teaching the truth, and the book has helped them come back, and it's, it's really been gratifying. I think in the same way that myself, I never would have dreamed 10 years ago that I would have a Catholic television program, that you never dreamed 10 years ago that you would have a book explaining your journey into the church that would be such an encouragement to so many Catholics. Yeah, I, I, as you probably could agree, 10 years ago I wouldn't have even dreamed that I would be a Catholic. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> We were already getting some emails and some phone calls, but I think one more question I wanted to at least pose, plant some more seeds for people who might have questions. Um, you recently did have a tape series that's also come out, and this is not a commercial for this, but your, your tape called The Rapture Revealed is interesting, uh, and maybe even timely in the sense that with five months before the end of the millennia, an awful lot of people that we all know are very interested, seeing all kinds of meaning with the turning of the year 2000. Every apocalyptic theory that's ever existed is out there in book form. And this issue of the rapture uh, has captured the minds of many Catholics who may not know its source. Tell us a little bit about your tape series. Well, I actually decided to do that uh, at the request of St. Joseph's Communications. And what's going on now isn't that much different than what happened a thousand years ago with the exception that this rapture idea is a relatively new twist. And what Catholics unwittingly get involved in is the fact that the, the rapture theorists have separated the second coming of Christ into two parts. They actually believe that there will be two second comings. They don't phrase it that way, but that's, and that's what I try to deal with and show how scripturally they really don't deal with scripture very well, much less what the church teaches. And uh, it's really not an option for a faithful Catholic to buy into the rapture, seven-year tribulation, uh, second coming, millennium idea that this rapture theory abounds with. Well, maybe later we'll get some questions on this. And but in some sense, it reminds me of that statement by Newman, to become deep in history is to cease to be Protestant, because anyone who knows their history and their theological history would know that the rapture idea is, is a real baby yeah. in terms of theological ideas. It's only been around since, what, 1830s, 40s? Right. It was started by a guy by the name of Darby. He was a Plymouth Brethren. And uh, you're right, it was about the 1830s. Uh, there's some debate as to whether, where he came up with the ideas. Uh, but the point is, is before the 1800s, it's virtually unknown. Yeah. Uh, and it, it, it's certainly an invented doctrine that right. has no historical foundation to it. And right. so Catholics should not be involved with that. But then even those outside the church, we encourage them to read history, examine, see where these ideas come from. Well, the other issue with, with the rapture is it, it's, a, it's a stumbling block to a lot of people that are Protestants, fundamentalists or evangelicals, that want to look at the church I know it was for me, I realized that if I became a Catholic, I had to give up the idea of the rapture. So I had to work yeah. personally through that doctrine first before I could really make that commitment to come into the church. Well, if anyone is interested both in the tape series and in finding out information about the book during the break, there will be a phone number of St. Joseph Communication that they would like to call. We have our first email. Let's get started. Are you ready? Okay. Sure, I'm ready. All right, this comes from Bill from California. Dear Marcus and David, Thank you for the Journey Home program on EWTN. Can you help me? I'm evangelizing an acquaintance of my 43-year-old son. The man is about 60 or so. He is married to his childhood sweetheart and has grown children. He is very intelligent, a genius in many ways. 
My son said that he believes in God, but that is as far as it goes. I prayed on this and sent him C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, for starters. Can you suggest the next and later steps that I can pursue with him to hopefully plant the seeds for his salvation? Well, Marcus, that's a good question. Wow. <laughs> how, how, uh, how to help him? What are some yeah. ideas that take him a little deeper? I mean, there's lots of different paths, but yeah. just from your experience. I would say that the, the single most convincing thing about Christianity is how it's lived. Mm -hmm. You know, we want a, a phrase that we can use. We want a, a book that we can give. And those things are good. It's, it's good to be able to answer questions and to, and to give people uh, phrases to think about that will trigger their thinking, but really how Christianity is lived. For a 60-year-old man, he's got a lot of history, and he probably needs to uh, experience Christian charity, Christian love, Christian commitment uh, firsthand through this man's son, the 43-year-old man's son, uh, and, and through the, the man himself. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you, love him, answer his questions, and uh, more than anything, pray for him. Yeah. Relational evangelism, what you're saying. Yeah. You know, this idea of just giving somebody a book. It's might, good. And the Lord certainly can use that. It's good. But, it, you know, most of us need uh, Jesus with skin on. That's right. And, in fact, we mentioned that, that uh, uh, the people that read your book, in a sense, the book was the, was the springboard. But immediately they went and found others they could talk, you know, tell me about this. Is it real? Yeah. It's, and then they needed to see it work out in yeah. other people's lives. We have our first caller. This is Susan from New York. Hello, Susan. What's your question for us tonight? Hi, Marcus. Um, I have a friend who was raised to, by his parents to be agnostic, and for years I've tried to be a good example to him as a, a Catholic and uh, hoped that he would convert to Catholicism. Um, out of the blue, he announced that he had decided to become a Unitarian. And I don't quite know how to react to this because I, I want to be supportive of, of him because um, this is a big step for him, but I don't know if I should be continuing to try and get him to see the merits of Catholicism. All right, the Unitarian well, issue. Yeah, Susan, thank you for calling. Now, Marcus... Uh, I think this is a classic issue of is the, is the glass half empty or half full. <laughs> uh, you may disagree with me on this, but uh, I think he's moving in the right direction. Mm -hmm. I think Unitarianism is closer to Catholicism than agnosticism is. Mm -hmm. So, Susan, if I were you, I, w I would say that to him. I would encourage him that he's on his journey. Don't let him think that this is his destination. This is a stopping point. This is a, 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 a way to come closer to Catholicism. Should you still talk to him about Catholicism? Oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. Don't stop. Keep praying for him. Keep evangelizing him. And I would look at this as a small step of success yeah. uh, rather than that he's rejecting what you've said. I think he's trying to find his way toward Catholicism. There's a difference between Unitarian with a capital U and of the little u. Oh yes, I'm assuming that it's the, yeah. the capital U. Yeah, uh, capital U meaning right. meaning the institutionalized Unitarian doctrines and theology. It's usually Unitarian universalism, which basically sees some aspect of understanding Jesus as now the one God and all are saved. Um, and and basically. This is, an uh, again, as you were talking about trajectories earlier, this is a trajectory of when you've cast away the, the, the authority of the church and the theology of the church for 1,500 years. In fact, Unitarianism came later, actually. Actually, it was a rebirth of an earlier heresy. Mm -hmm. But when you lose track of all of that, the history, it's a new idea that comes along, thinks it's novel, and in fact, it doesn't realize it was one of the early heresies of the church that was shown to be wrong. So... You know, through your relationship with this person, you can eventually help them to see the historic church, to see why the church, you know, stood for Trinitarianism in the third and fourth century. You know, that's what you need them to get them to see. But as you said earlier, the relationships. Yeah, and and don't give up on this man. Uh, you know, he, this is one tiny step. Uh, you know, it may not be very long till he takes another step toward the church. Okay. All right. Let's take our next email. 
comes from Pat Francis. I'm not sure how to characterize my question. I appreciate your time with all my questions. My son is studying the church, and I really don't like him relying on me for all his answers. He asked why we need theologians. Doesn't Jesus want things to be simple? <laughs> I answered that things have changed since the time of Jesus and we need people who study and the authority to find answers to questions that come up. Is there more I could have said? Well, it, Theologians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Us and lawyers, right? Blessings and cur curses in <laughs> yeah, a sense. Lawyers and theologians. Yeah. Um, th this comes up a lot in Protestantism. You know, Jesus was so simple and why do you make it so complex? And Marcus, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Jesus I read is not that simple. I think Jesus said some very complex, very difficult to understand things. In fact, there were an awful lot of times he had to explain to the apostles who were basically saying, I don't get it, Jesus, what were you trying to say? Right, and, and these are guys that spent full time with him for two, yeah. three years, and after two of those years, they're still saying, Jesus, explain this to me. Yeah. So uh, the, the idea of the simple Jesus is, is a modernistic yeah idea and and it's that he was a good man and all he meant to do was to get us to love each other that's I think where the simple yeah. Jesus comes from but it's not the Jesus of the Bible the Jesus of Scripture uh, had a very complex message to give us and it's basically because no one ever said the mind of God was simple you know I can't understand everything about the mind of God I struggle to understand just the little surface things so uh, I think I would ask, the, this was a son, I believe, wasn't it? Not? The mother wants to explain yeah. this to her son. I would ex ask the, the son, if I was the mother, to explain to me exactly where in Scripture it says that Jesus was simple. Yeah. And yet maybe another also area to go would be to help distinguish the need of an authority, the church, to help us understand how to interpret Christ, because that's what Jesus did. He gave the apostles the Holy Spirit and said that the Holy Spirit would lead them into truth and that they would remember all that he had taught them so they could pass it on faithfully. But, so the church is the one that decides the correct interpretations. Theologians help the church, they're part of the church, they have training, philosophy and such, but a theologian doesn't have the same authority that the church does, there's a distinction there. So that's why theologians can sometimes be a blessing, can sometimes be a curse, because maybe they take upon their own shoulders an authority which they shouldn't have. And the danger is then once you leave the authority of the church, that's why there are so many different Christian groups that are teaching things that are contradictory, is because they're often at the mercy of their theologians who come up with some new angle. Well, like the rapture. I mean, some new angle on revelations. Everyone trusts this shining light and they follow them. And, and they're very charismatic leaders. Yeah. That's right. um, if I wanted to have a, a simple explanation of Christianity, I think the catechism of the Catholic Church, though not simple, is as simple mm -hmm. as you can make it, as understandable as you can make it, and it still be thorough. Yeah. And it's not really too difficult you know, for That's the layman to understand. strongly encourage it to everyone. Let's take our next phone call. This is Bob from Alabama. Hello, Bob. What's your Hello. question for us tonight? Yes, I've got a question. At the time the uh, Eucharist was instituted, the Sacrament of Reconciliation had not yet been instituted, so naturally the apostles couldn't go to confession. But I've often wondered why there's not been anything of them repenting of their sins before receiving communion. I'll hang up and listen to your answer. Thank you. All right. Well, you know, Marcus, every once in a while you get a question you've never heard before, and that's a, <laughs> that's a new one. Um, I think we, we first of all have to distinguish what Scripture tells us from what happened. In other words, yeah. Scripture doesn't try to give us a blow-by-blow -blow account of every single thing. In fact, John says in his gospel that if everything were written down that Jesus said or did, there wouldn't be enough books in the world to contain it all. So it, exactly. it isn't everything. So um, to, to assume that just because Scripture doesn't tell us that the disciples confessed their sins to Jesus before uh, doesn't mean that they didn't do it. Um, second of all, I can't imagine living with Jesus and not keeping uh, very short accounts with God. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, it, it just is not a possibility, I don't think. So uh, for that reason, I think that they probably were in a state of grace uh, for communion. And Jesus talked often about repentance. He began his ministry with repent, the kingdom of God is coming. When he taught the Lord's Prayer, he, he emphasized the need of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. If we expect to have forgiveness from heaven, 
He also talked to, remember Peter, about how many times you should forgive someone. So it's in there all the time. What came later was the actual institution that the apostles could be the ones that forgive, all right, mm -hmm. in John 20. But not whether they forgave or not. I mean, they're walking with Jesus every day, as you said. And here's Peter in a boat. What does he say? Get away from me. I am a sinner. Well, if that isn't repentance, or at least contrition in his heart. So. Yeah, I, even though Scripture doesn't give us this, I, I imagine the, the disciples, later the apostles, uh, keeping very short accounts with God through, through their relationship with Jesus. I mean, they had a face-to-face -face relationship with the original confessor. Let's take this next email. From Paul in Charleston, South Carolina. So, gentlemen, can you explain the difference between Petra, Petros, and Lithos as used in Greek for the meaning of rock? This gets us back to that issue of, yeah. uh, of remember the Aramaic and the Greek. Right. And everything. Exactly. What was his name again? Paul. Paul. Um, Paul. The the difference in some of these are are a gender difference in the Greek. Now we don't have a real gender problem in English. In other words, a word in our language. In our language, the way English language is made, we don't have those gender problems. But a lot of languages do, and Greek is one of those that does. And words will be given a gender, just like you used to always think of a of a hurricane as a she. Now that's mm -hmm. been changed. Uh, ships always used to be female. Uh, that I don't know is is completely true anymore either. But in our language, even if it was there, we don't change the spelling of a word in a particular way because it has a masculine or feminine. Right. Feminine gender. Now, uh, uh, except Greek, in personal pronouns, but right. that's it. Right. Exactly. Greek, however, takes a word like rock and makes it feminine or uh, masculine. So uh, it's really a language problem within Greek uh, that really doesn't affect the meaning of what Jesus said, I take it we're getting back to what Jesus said to Peter uh, on 16. this rock, right? I will build my church. If you ignore the Greek and read it in English, you're actually closer to the original words that Jesus used, which were actually in Aramaic. Aramaic is more like English in this case, in that it doesn't have those gender problems either. So that when uh, in Aramaic Jesus said those words to Peter, it actually sounded more like how we would say it in English, which is, I name you rock, and on this rock, right. I'm going to build my church. Kepha, or, or Kepha in both places. Both places. But it then when the it's translated word. into Greek, the, the word that would have been used for rock it, it would have been feminine. a feminine name. So he had Jesus changed it rather than, it would have been like saying, I call you Petrina. <laughs> and, and all of the 11 disciples would have joked about that until <laughs> Peter, <laughs> Peter finally got tired of it. So he, he changed the gender of that because it was a man's name. All right, excellent. Let's take our next caller, Jimmy from Kentucky. Hello, what's your question for us tonight? Uh, hello, Mr. Uh, Marcus. Yes. And Mr. Curry, great show. I love the show. Uh, when you first come on two years ago, I taped, I think, every show for oh, the first great. year. Got them all on tape. I know where to send people when they're asking me for copies. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I got Jimmy a, a problem uh, with uh, Luke 16. Yeah. I've had a lot of priests tell me that uh, the rich man is in, in hell. Uh, I, I presume they mean Gehenna. And I want to know what the official teaching is where the rich man is at, because I, I, I understand it that he's not in hell, because if he's in hell, he would have no, he wouldn't be able to uh, uh, converse with Abraham, because, you know, hell, you, you're lost, you're, it's it. Uh, yes. I just want to know what the official teaching is, where the rich man is at. Thank you, Jimmy. You know, you know the text, right, of course? The, yeah, uh, the, it's, it's actually a story. We're not told for sure whether or not it's real or not. It, it might be could be taken as a parable mm -hmm. in order to, and, and in parables you can't press home every detail of a story. Um, however, I, I think the generally accepted interpretation of that is that the, that the rich man was in what we would call purgatory mm -hmm. or in uh, that holding place before Jesus' death, uh, Hades. Uh, but I don't think we would generally say that it would be hell. Yeah, because there, there seems to be... Uh, There's a communication going yeah, on between Lazarus right. and this rich man, which definitely does not happen between heaven and hell. So, Jimmy, you're right in your reservations, 
probably what's going on uh, with the, the priests that you're talking to is they're just generalizing. And they're saying, well, he's not in the good place, and he's, so that means yeah. he's in hell. Yeah. Uh, he's not in heaven, so he's not in, in hell. And it's, in many Catholic circles, um, people almost don't want to use the word purgatory. Yeah. Uh, well, in fact, I would recommend to anyone, if you can get a copy of a recent statement made by John Paul II in his most recent Wednesday audience, he talked in his teaching on purgatory and what it really means as that place of, of purification so that we've all, a person who's in the state of purgatory or being purged of their impurities has already entered, you know, mm -hmm. is already on the edge of heaven. It's not gonna, it's, 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 you're not in this decision, are you going to end up in heaven or hell? It's not a halfway place in which one has a decision to go one way or the other yet. That's already been decided this side of death. But purgatory is the but the entrance, the doorway. Yeah. I like to call it the vestibule, yeah, the yeah, vestibule because it's a nice big word. That, That's right. You know, but uh, you know, it's a vestibule. If you get into the vestibule, you know you're going to be in heaven. Uh, it's a place of pain, but it's ultimately a place of love because you are going to make it into heaven, which is a place of love without the pain. And G made also encourage you to look at the catechism on this very issue. In fact, exactly. I think it uses this parable as an illustration of purgatory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the catechism, if not there in most apologetic books, it uses that as, as a, an example of that uh, entrance way into um, We've got a long uh, email here from Chicago, from David in Chicago. Did you write this your own? You I, I probably gave myself an okay. easy question, I hope. All right. <laughs> this is hello, Marcus. God bless you in your show. David Curry, your book was a true godsend. My question is this. My parents are ex-Catholic evangelicals who are devoted to Moody Radio here in Chicago who are staunch opponents of any form of Romanism. They do not yet know of my return to the church, and I am nervous about telling them. I have begun to write a letter to tell them of my decision and to let them know what I believe as a Catholic. I feel this is necessary since I am sure that they left the church out of ignorance of her true teachings. Do you think that it is acceptable to tell them through a letter, and is there anything, rec is there anything recommended I include? Again, God bless both you. David, and thank you both for your assistance. You've shown me in my journey home. This guy's in your back door, Chicago. Yeah, David. It sounds uh, like his journey is similar to yours because yeah, you had to really face does. the very same issue. Right. Um, well, I'm just going to give you my personal opinion, David. I would write a letter. And the reason I would write a letter is it's very difficult to take the emotion out of that front, frontal assault is how they're going to take it uh, when you try to explain to them what you've done. I think in a letter, uh, that's originally what my book was, was a long letter, and it got a little bit too long. It got so long, I <laughs> wrote another one to tell them what I was doing. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe a, a two, uh, one or two or three page letter to try to explain to your folks that you love them, that you're so very, very thankful that they raised you to love Jesus Christ, that they introduced you to Jesus Christ, that you, that you owe them a debt of gratitude that you can never repay. But at the same time, uh, in your search to follow Jesus Christ closer, you've come across some things that you need to explain to them. And then, you know, list out as unemotional as you can, definitely with no judgment of, of their uh, theology, what you've decided to do. I think that's probably a good way to do that. I, uh, I did that with all my family, in other words, my siblings and my parents. And I mailed the letters all the same day so that they would get them all on the same day. And, um, and then realize that you're going to ha still have to sit down and talk to them. But ask uh, for the grace to try to explain it to them in a way that they can, that they can accept and understand. It, again, it reminds us of the relationships because uh, this David knows his family, how they might respond. And so that, that advice might not be the same for everyone. Right. But it's knowing those that you want to communicate. Sometimes you know that because of the hardness of heart that they're not going to listen at all. And so you just have to pray. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even if you're writing them a letter, make sure the praise, prayers never cease. Because mm -hmm. it's always God's grace that is able to breach the hearts of those that are not willing to listen. So why don't we take a break? I'll give you a breather. Okay. And also those of you who want to send us some more emails or call in with your questions. During the break, you'll find information about David's books and tapes. But please stay with us and we'll take your questions.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. My guest for this Open Line First Friday is David Curry. And uh, he's here to take whatever question you might want to pose. Uh, you know, give him some rough ones, you know, make, make him sweat <laughs> a little bit up here. Uh, if you'd like to call us, it's 1-800-221-9460. And send us some emails at journeyhome at EWTN.com. I think we've got plenty of emails here to deal with, okay. uh, keep you busy. But you know, send one, you might slip it through if you have a particularly challenging one. Let's begin with this email. This comes from John in Boston. Dear Marcus and David, I had to leave the Catholic Church because I couldn't defend the assumption and purgatory. There's no biblical or historical evidence for the assumption, and Revelation 12 is not a good proof text. Also, doesn't purgatory deny the sufficiency of Christ's atonement? Thank you. Sounds like the kinds of challenges we often will get on the issues of apologetics. Yeah. Um, well, Marcus, I, I think that first of all, is this a female, male, do we know? John. John. Okay, John. I think you're, first of all, I'd like to disagree just gently with you about why you left the church. I don't think you left over purgatory and the assumption. I think you left over the question of authority. Um, if the church needs to back up everything that it teaches from a Bible reference, then it's not the church that Christ founded in Acts. I mean, you look back at how those apostles treated truth and it they weren't you know backing things up with bible verses at, at every turn so i think maybe the the situation goes a little deeper than john thinks it does i think he has to deal with okay what kind of church did christ set up what was the leadership of that church like now what kind of authority did jesus himself give those men and i think if you look at scripture very carefully just start with Scripture, you'll see that he did not place Scripture over those men, that those men actually uh, produced under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, Scripture, and they did not draw a, a real strict differentiation between what they called, or what we call tradition, what verbally is passed down, and what was written down in Scripture. Um, so, let me throw us. Go ahead. You, you keep your thought there. I'm going to throw a text we've often given on this uh, show, and I want all of you to look this up and remember this verse. It's a very important verse. It comes from 2 Thessalonians 2:14, and Paul is writing. It's one of his earliest letters. Paul is writing. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. And so we see that what they taught and was delivered, came both orally and sometimes by writing. In fact, when you read the New Testament writings, often the reason he's writing is because he can't do what he would most prefer to do, which is to speak in person. That was the normal way that the truth of the church was delivered. Exactly. Writing was a second option for a number of reasons. One, parchment was very expensive, it was rare, uh, not everybody could read. So uh, the, the regular communication was was orally, so the fact that it, something might not be in Scripture doesn't mean at all that it wasn't what the apostles taught. But that isn't the only issue here. Yeah, so, so that's the number one thing, John, is I think you need to look at authority, and uh, I think that that you know, will, will change uh, a little bit of your perspective. Then uh, the second part of that question was something about purgatory, and I don't Well, he was also was. saying that, for example, the assumption isn't in Scripture, and he was also saying that purgatory... I don't, don't have the email now in front of me, but okay, purgatory uh, denied the sufficiency of Christ's okay. atonement. Okay, let's go back to the first part of the question again then. Uh, it's very possible that the most accepted doctrines and truths of the church are exactly what is not in Scripture. You see, Scripture was written usually to solve a problem. The church in Corinth was having a problem, so 1 Corinthians got written. Uh, that didn't solve all the problems, so another you know, epistle was written to the Corinthians. So the assumption and purgatory very well may not be very clear in Scripture for the simple fact that everyone in the early church accepted it without question. That seems to be something that Protestants a lot of times don't think about. Um, a second issue with the assumption is let's realize that it happened rather late. A lot of the books were already written. Yeah. So it was not a historical fact yet when some of these books were being written. And it was also something that I imagine was pretty well known when it happened. 
In other words, that spread like wildfire, I'm sure, through the church, just as you said, by word of mouth. No one had to write a letter about that. That, that passed from person to person to person very, very rapidly. Now, as far as purgatory um, challenging the sufficiency of Christ, I think perhaps uh, it's, it's a little bit of a, a misunderstanding of what purgatory is for. Purgatory, as we talked about already, is only for those people that have already been redeemed. So, John, if, if uh, a person goes to purgatory, it's because of Christ's work on the cross. That's the only thing that got them in, was the grace of God. However, what purgatory does is it finishes up the work that we haven't finished on our character before we die. Now, some people, uh, their uh, work on their character is all done by the time they, they die. Which is still a work of grace. And it's, it's still a work of grace. Yes. And it's all through grace. It's, and, and it's only meritorious because God deems it meritorious. But we call those people saints. Um, and of course, they don't have to be recognized as saints by the church to get into heaven directly. But the church, in a few cases, says these people, we're quite sure, did get into heaven without going through purgatory. Um, but the, Jesus was very clear that we could not see God unless we were perfect. And the simple fact of the matter is, John, that most of us when we die, although we love Christ and we try to live the gospel, Marcus, I think you'd agree, most of us are not perfect. <laughs> so that is the purpose of purgatory, John. The purpose of purgatory is to give that grace the additional time that it needs in order to perfect my character. Um, and it may be unfortunate, but pain is what perfects our character. Not just in purgatory, but suffering is also what perfects my character here. Now, I don't always like that fact, but my character is very often not perfected by enjoyment and luxury is pain. Pain that does it, suffering that does it. Purgatory is often described as the work of God's uh, burning, purifying love. And it purges us. Purges us. Just like and the that's, word. That's where the name comes from. I encourage John to, to read what the church truly teaches about purgatory and, and not what others are saying the church means by it. What does the church truly teach by it? Now, I think anybody that has a question about the Catholic Church should own a copy of okay. the Catechism of the Catholic Church. If they don't own a copy and go and, and read there first what the church itself says about their own doctrines, then they're being really dishonest when they criticize. Yeah. Or, if or, they don't read the Catechism yeah, first. If they don't read the Catechism first so that they know that they're actually right. talking about what we believe. Let's take our next caller, the Steve from Illinois. What's your question for us? Yes, Marcus. Uh, my question is on... Uh, uh, the, uh, Genesis 3.15, the last part of that verse. Yes. I have two different Catholic Bibles here, the Duray Reims Bible, which in the last part of that verse reads, She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt let light and wait for her heel. Now that sounds like they're speaking of the Blessed Mother there. And the other Catholic Bible, which is, the, which is the American Bible, it reads, He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. It sounds like they're speaking of Jesus there. Yeah. And I'm just concerned which one of these are right. All right. Thank you. Uh, it's a good question because with so many different translations out there, recognizing every translation was formed by a committee, <laughs> you, know, that, that, you know, in terms of trying to interpret what the original language meant as the Holy Spirit gave it to us, that we end up with lots of places in Scripture where there are a diff couple different readings. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I, I totally understood what his question was. I'm reading out of the RSV, okay. and it says, um, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's speaking to the serpent and between her, your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Um, speaking of the seed. I think in the Dewey Rames, where it says, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the hill. He, you and the woman, it makes it sound like it's referring to Mary. To Mary. As the one who does the bruising. And so we have these different interpretations that have come down throughout history. Who's doing the bruising? Okay, my guess is, without looking at the original text, is that the Hebrew's not real clear. That would be my guess. Yeah. Um, I'm not so sure 
um, that it's essential that we, that we distinguish. Uh, I believe that Mary and Jesus are on the same team. You know, um, and whatever Mary is able to accomplish, she accomplishes, she accomplishes through, through Jesus Christ, Christ and His grace, right? Um, so I'm not sure that uh, uh, you know. I'm I'm not trying to to minimize the question. I'm just not so sure that it's a, an essential question. Um, and and I, my my guess is that the Hebrew is not real clear. Yeah, I'm not an expert on Hebrew. Yeah, either am I. And I'm I'm a feeling we might get ourselves deep in here on this one. I. Yeah. I'm looking at the translation that I have, and I happen to have one of my old Protestant Bibles with me. Uh, I often keep this because of the work that I do, since I'm often working mm -hmm. with those outside the church. It also has all my notes in it, so I like it. In this particular version, I will put enmity between you and the woman. Uh, he's speaking to the serpent. In between your seed and her seed, her seed referring to Christ, he shall, he referring to the, the seed, who is Jesus, bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And I don't have a Dewey Rames here. It would be good yeah. to see that. To yeah, this, I don't either. This is the RSV you, Catholic the, edition. This is the Catholic edition. You might edition. look in the back of that where the notes are while I'm taking our next, reading our next email and to see whether that makes a comment on that. Okay. So let's take our next email. This comes from Alan Awaken. Hello, Alan. It says, Dear Marcus and David, I was wondering, uh, all of a sudden I lost the email. Oh, I was wondering what the difference is between a disciple and an apostle. I think this comes from a young viewer, too. Okay. So that's a, a good question. A disciple and apostle. Um, a disciple is more of a follower, and we all start as disciples. Uh, the 12 all started as disciples. An apostle is someone that's commissioned to go out, and it's someone that has received a message, and is, it's time for them to head out. and. and make disciples. Hopefully we're all both of those. Uh, hopefully we've become disciples of Christ and uh, we're trying to apostolize uh, in, in our daily life. We're all disciples and out of that group are the specific group that Christ had set aside. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I found in the notes in the back of the revised standard version Catholic edition that's uh, been reprinted by Ignatius. Right in the middle, at the end of the Old Testament, they have notes that help you deal with some of these issues. And I'm, maybe I'll just take a moment to read what it says in the RSV CE about this. It says, the Latin Vulgate has the reading ipsa conteret, she shall bruise. Some old Latin manuscripts have this reading, and it occurs also in St. Augustine uh, in some of his writings, which is earlier than St. Jerome's translation. It could be due originally to a copyist mistake, which was then seen to contain a genuine meaning, namely that Mary too would have her share in the victory inasmuch as she was mother of the Savior. So again, it gets us into the idea that reminds us that the reason we have the Bible at all is because men and women copied this by hand for centuries before in 1450 it was printed in the books. Mm -hmm. For almost 1500 years it was copied by hand. And so that's part of the work of theologians today is to decide which was the original writing when we do find these differences. And I think it's interesting that in this case too there's not a tremendous amount of meaning difference. That's right. And there, you know, the theologians can argue about which of these two is the way to go, but really when it comes right down to how do I live my life and how, you know, does it affect my day-to-day -day faith, it, it, it doesn't make that much of a difference. Let's take our next caller. Hello, this is Donna from Pennsylvania. What's your question for us tonight? Hi Marcus, thank you so much for hearing sure, my call. Ma um, I was just reading a book by Robert A. Surgenis on Not by Faith Alone. Yes. And it explains in there justification. And when it speaks about our Lord and how he um, was a fragrant offering mm -hmm. and a sacrifice, I wanted someone to explain that to my husband and I. Now, it also states in there that Christ did not take the sins as far as punishment for himself. And it explains that he was um, this perfect offering. And my husband said, well, then why did the Lord say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh -huh. Didn't God the Father turn his head from Jesus? Right. And I said, that doesn't seem right to me. Right. And I just wanted someone else to explain that. All right. Thank you, Don. We get into the big issue of justification. And, of course, I was, you're reading a great book. Yeah, great book. Um, I don't remember that part of Bob's book. 
Um, and I know Bob's been a guest yes, here. Yes. Um, so Donnie, yeah. <laughs> he get, should ask the difference. Get some old tapes. Yeah, from, get, get some old Bob tapes. Um, but uh, justification, uh, of course, the, the 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 conversation between Protestants and Catholics is is justification by faith alone. And uh, as Catholics, we believe that justification is by faith along with works. The only part of the the Protestant equation that we have problems with is the alone. And what's interesting is the only time in the Bible that it talks about justification and faith and alone all together is in James and James specifically says <laughs> justification is not by faith alone. Um, so uh, but you're, you're well, leaping through that. She also was asking the question about uh, when Jesus says, Father, you know, oh my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And it, it seemed that here he is taking the sins on his shoulders, not his own sins, as it says in Scripture. He takes the sins of us all on his shoulders. But she didn't understand the separation that Jesus seems to be talking about at that point. And I was looking up, with the, didn't know if I'd find it in time, but in fact what he's doing with that verse is he's quoting a psalm. He's quoting a psalm, and in Scripture, we have to be careful that Jesus and the Apostle Paul and Peter, they didn't proof text. When they quoted a psalm, what they were referring people to was the meaning of that entire psalm from beginning to end. And so when they made that quote, it was a quote that drew their attention to this old psalm, which was a messianic psalm pointing to his sacrifice. That's really what it's referring to. Now, I think there's a sense in which also, right, I mean, uh, the author of Hebrews says that he was tempted in every way that we are, but without sin. Without sin. And so even this, the struggle that was on his shoulder as he's on the cross, feeling the weight of all the sins of the world, that weight led him to feel the kinds of you know, emptiness and distance from the Father that we feel because of our sins. Mm -hmm. But the difference was that in his, he didn't go to despair, which is the, the distance of sin. Mm -hmm. Do you want to add anything to that? No, that's a great. Oh, okay. Well, it's your, your <laughs> you, show. You did well. Huh? <laughs> Let's take our next email here. This is Nicole from Iowa. Hello. Like many others, I have strayed away from the church, only going on such occasions as Christmas and Easter. I have not gone to the sacrament of reconciliation for such a long time. I want to confess my entire life. Is that practical? How can I get back to the church? Thank you. And she's a first-time watcher. Welcome, Nicole from Iowa. Great that you tune in tonight. Well, Nicole, I'm glad you called. Um, I lived for 40 years without <laughs> the sacrament of reconciliation. And let me just tell you, Nicole, it's worth going back. I think you'll find that the priest will be more gentle with you than you feel like you deserve. But I think after you do it, and, you know, I did 40 years. It took me a little while, Marcus. <laughs> um, Need a few weeks in that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, Nicole, I think you'll find that the priest will be gentle with you. Uh, and I think you'll find that after you've done it, you will be so thankful that God gave you this avenue to come back to his church. You're right on the right track. I mean, you're, you said you've, you've left the church and you want to come back. This is the very first thing that, that you can do to get right back to where you left. Um, so I would, I would strongly recommend that you, you call a priest and uh, tell him exactly what you just wrote in this email. Say, you know, I, I want to come back to my faith. I want to do it the correct way and I want to go to confession. And I'm wondering, can I make an appointment? For a general confession like this, your whole life, a lot of priests will say, you know, let's meet maybe at a different time. If you want to stay anonymous, you have that right. Um, then just find out from him when he has confession hours. Um, and most of the time it's on Saturday. Uh, but you can find out from the priest and just stop by. Uh, you can either do it face to face, or if you've been away from the church for a long time, you may not be comfortable with that, and you may want to go behind the screen. Personally, I do both ways. Uh, there's some priests that I go to uh, that I feel more comfortable behind the screen. And uh, then there's one priest that I go to very often, and, and if 
when he's the one I'm confessing to, I, I feel comfortable face to face. But I think you'll find that it's a gift that God has given you uh, as a re-entry into the church. I strongly encourage you. Thank you. Let's take our next caller. It's Joel from Ohio. Hello, Joel. What's your question for Hello, us tonight? Hello, yes. Um, I'm hoping you can um, set me straight and humble me at the same time. Um, less than seven years, I've studied Jesus' teachings. I see what he tells about evolution, about thinking the thoughts, developing the, the perceptions, and manifesting them until you're like him. And it seems to me that Christians spend so much time intellectualizing Christianity, worrying about this book of the Bible, that book of the Bible. Why are we not aggressively following him? Why do we spend so much time being intellectual? I'm Protestant studying for the ministry, and I'm resentful that I have to spend so much time learning Old Testament when I want to be just like him. Why? I mean, why is this? Am I, have I missed something? Help me. Please humble me. All right, Joe. Thank you for calling. Why not just Jesus, you know? And, uh, well, and why uh, not that, just that little phrase, what would Jesus do? Isn't that all that I need? Yeah. Well, that's a good place to start. What would Jesus do? That's a, an excellent question. Um, but where do we go from there? If you don't know much about Jesus, you may not answer the, que you know, the question properly. So uh, that's why we study in order to try to understand what would Jesus do in this situation. Um, Joe, I think though you're also touching on something that I noticed in my journey, and that is um, Protestantism. You said you're studying for the Protestant ministry, Joe. Protestantism, by its very nature, is more rationalistic. It's more uh, in the mind, cerebral. Um, Catholicism is more in action. It's, it's, and I can't say it too much better than that. I'm just trying to express Certainly something that I noticed. There, of course. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, n there's not an either or. Right. But I just noticed the difference of the emphasis in the Catholic Church of, well, maybe you can't answer every apologetic question, but have you fed the poor this week? Yeah. You know, and that's not as acceptable in the Protestant yeah. uh, traditions. Um, so, Joe, I think maybe you're, you're uh, experiencing something, uh, and maybe you need to think that through a little bit. We, we don't have enough time to completely answer his question. I think it's a good one, because in some ways, Joe, those are the issues that brought me to Catholicism, because the problem that I found outside was that the reason we had to stay at the cerebral re level was not only to understand why we are here and the Catholics are there, but why I'm here as a Presbyterian and I'm not over there as a Methodist, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Assembly of God, Church of Christ, Mormon, Jehovah Witness, because you always have to be defining that rather than just following Jesus. And as Catholics, we recognize the authority of the church so that once we understand this is how we understand Christ, now we can move on. Yes. It's like, why do we begin the rosary with the... With the creed, because then we can pray, because we know what we believe. Now we can go into prayer. Exactly. We have about, I don't know, a minute or so to go. David, I want you to explain one last thing. Okay. How is becoming a Catholic drawing you closer to Jesus Christ? Well, I think, Marcus, um, that is, is something that I was worried about, first of all, when I first became Catholic. But I think the depth of the devotions that are available to a Catholic give you so much more you know, ability to learn about Christ and to follow Christ and to get to know Christ and to get to know his mother um, that I never had. Um, and, and I think of the common ones, like the rosary. Uh, you know, the, the rosary is a beautiful way for us to get to know not just Mary, but to get to know uh, her son, Christ, and to get to know God's plan for us. Um, so the I've become closer to Jesus Christ because of all the different devotions I can participate in. David, thank you so much. In fact, I want to encourage those reading the catechism that they're not just being a theology. Make sure you get to the section on prayer. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being with us, David. Thank you for joining us on the journey home. We'll see you again next week. God bless. Mm -hmm.